talking today about, uh, about God's miracle working power. Are you ready for a miracle? Anybody in the house? All right, a few of you, a few of you ready for a miracle. Talking about uh, breaking our fast and, uh, and seeing God's miracle working power in our lives. Acts chapter 3 is uh, our text. It's our main text today. Acts chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 3 through 8. I encourage you to take notes inside of every bulletin. There is a, uh, there's a place or a sheet of paper in there for you to take notes. Uh, you'll retain more of it. So write it down so that you can retain that and put it in your heart. When the, when the angel spoke to Mary, it said, and she pondered all these things in her heart. If you'll write, write these things down and you'll take notes, it's a whole lot easier to ponder them in your heart. That'll stay with you a lot longer. Okay? All right, let's read uh, beginning at verse 3. When he, and he was a lame man, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some money. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. As he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up stood on his feet and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Wouldn't that be really cool to see? I, I've, I've seen something much like that take place. I'll tell you about it in a, in a few minutes. I have seen God do that kind of miraculous, instantaneous healing in some lives. Let me read one more scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. For God says, at just the right time, I heard you. On the day of salvation, I helped you. Indeed, the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Some of you need to hear that last part of that verse there. Indeed, the right time is now is now. Everybody say now. now. Father, I pray today that your word will go forth. Father, that you will give each of us ears to hear your word, the mind to understand and the heart to receive. And may it build up our faith in you. And Father, I pray today that before we leave this place, you will pour out your power, your glory, your spirit, your miracle working power in here, and you will touch lives as you desire. Lord, I pray this today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Most of us don't know what day it is on God's calendar. We don't know the day that God has already marked on his timetable for us to receive our miracle. We don't know that day, but it is important for us to be ready for that day. It's important for us to live every day like today is the day. I, I do believe that for some of you today, that right now is it's the right time, that today is the day. But I want to talk about some miracle moments today, some miracle moments. And the challenge is, is for us to be aware of the miracle moments when they come, that we not miss it, that we not dismiss it, but that we are ready and willing and able to receive and 
and then do so. But sadly, there are too many Christians who have slept through their harvest, and they've missed their miracle moment. Too often times we're not aware God has a life-changing, mind-altering, spirit-redeeming, soul-cleansing miracle for us, and it may very well be today. I'm looking forward to hearing some testimonies about what God has done in your lives during our 21-day Daniel's fast. I'm looking forward to hearing you say, this is what I was praying about, and this is how God answered my prayer. Even this past week, one of our our college students, her car broke down in the middle of the week, coupled with the school bills, financial aid that hadn't dropped, needing a job, needing financial breakthrough, preparing for graduation and life after graduation, she was under a lot of stress. She shared her need this past week with her G2 group, and and Miss Jane felt inspired to give her an encouraging word about trusting God and that that God was going to come through for her in her situation. That was Friday or Thursday night. Friday night, she sent us a testimony of how God had answered her prayer, and her car was being fixed, and it wasn't costing her anything. She went in in from Wednesday night when the cars broke to feeling stressed and pressured to now Friday night feeling joyous, celebrating what God has done. There was a joy and there was a peace inside of her You see, we serve a great God who cares about his children. If you believe it, say amen. See, it blesses me to see the spiritual growth in her life over the last couple years. And to see her, I know for sure this was her second year to join us in the Daniels Fast. May, May have been the third. I'm very proud of her. Very proud of so many of our students who have been fasting and praying for spiritual growth and for a breakthrough. Amen? See, church, what I want to keep reminding you today is that you can trust God. You can trust Him with your life. You can trust Him with your soul. You can trust Him with your needs. We know the Scripture says, My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. All. And so those needs that you have in life that might seem small to some, God still cares about. Those needs that might be insignificant for somebody else, but for you, it's a big deal. God cares about. And you can trust him. He has always supplied and he always will. You see, God knows the things that you don't know. Think about this again for a moment. God knows the things you don't know. God already knows the dates and the times and the place that he has set aside for your blessing, for your miracle. That God already has provided, let's say, a ram caught in a thicket on Mount Moriah to be the offering needed for the sacrifice. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, jot down Genesis chapter 22 and go back and and read that today or this week and see how God provided in advance for Abraham's sacrifice. God always knows what we need. I have a friend who he now lives in Missouri, and he be, became my worship pastor up in the Panhandle. And he told me the story of how he hadn't been married too long, and 
He and his wife were having some real financial needs, some struggles. He was living in a, I think a, at that time, a trailer on the property of his in-laws. He was working for his father-in-law who had a used car lot and a salvage yard. Well, he and his wife went to church that, that Sunday morning. There were some problems with the car, electrical, I think. I think it was the, like brake lights or something, and he was having to work on it that afternoon, trying to get this thing fixed before they'd go back to church Sunday night. He said he was really aggravated to have to be out there, and so he, he, he went to one of the salvage cars out there, and he's having to take apart the trunk to get in there to take apart, I don't know, wiring harness or something. And he's stripping this car down in, in the trunk area. And as he is grumbling and griping about doing this, he pulls back a, a panel, and inside of that panel was several hundred dollars of cash just stuffed in there. Inside of this old junk salvaged car. And he said he, he grabbed the money and he's counting through it and he's, he's rejoicing and he's shouting. He, he is, as his in-laws pulled into the driveway, he is jumping up and down and he's waving this cash about and he is praising God because God met and supplied a need that he couldn't supply on his own. <laughs> he, said, he said him and his father-in-law started stripping the trunks out of all those cars looking for something else. <laughs> They didn't find any more, but God had already met his need and supplied it that day. He, God already knows what he has set aside for you, for your life, for your miracle in advance before you know it, before you realize you need it. He may have had some druggy stuffed cash inside of, the, inside of a panel, inside of a trunk, and leave it there for your moment in time. That's the kind of God that we serve. We need to be ready for our miracle moment. The only way that I am aware of the miracle moment is that I must continually stay aware. I need to stay aware of what God is doing. Stay alert. Stay aware. Be ready. Write this one down. We must be available continually in order to receive from God continuously. I've seen this firsthand in doing, in doing some different missions trips. And I've been in some very poor communities where the people trusted God continually because they, for them, they had to. And, but I saw how God would supply continuously. They, they had a faith that I truly admired. They had a faith that God was going to take care of them and supply their needs, and they, they had to trust God to supply their needs, and he, and he did. But if you're going to receive your miracle moment from God, there are some requirements. And the first requirement is that you be available, that you must be available now, the good news for you, every one of you sitting here, is that you're alive. Look at your neighbor and ask them, you got a pulse? I mean, the first requirement is that you're available. And if you're alive, well, you're available, right? You see, when Peter and John encountered the lame man, they could have said, you know, in spite of of the pain and weakness in your life, or in spite of the, in spite of not being able to do what other people are doing, or in spite of not being able to move about freely as others do, or in, in spite of not being able to work or to even walk, 
or have the full freedom of your mobility, the facts are you're still here. You're alive. You may have have had difficulties. You may have pain. You may have your limits, but thank God you're alive. And so you're available. And so you're eligible for the miraculous working power of God in your life. Listen, you, you have survived up until this moment, and it doesn't matter how, how broken or wounded or frustrated you may have been or might still be, you right now, thank God, you're alive. And as long as you're alive, then the miracle is possible. You see, to receive any kind of miracle, you must be available for that miracle. So you, you meet that one requirement right there. You're alive. Who do miracles happen to? Who do they happen to? Back in the summer of 2012, I had a kidney stone attack. And for those of you, those of you who have ever had one, you know the pain in which I dealt with. And it was pretty severe. And I agonized for a couple hours waiting for uh, the clinic to open later regretted even doing that because they sent me on to the hospital for x-rays and other evaluations. They sent me home with pain meds and, and said, let's see if you pass them. And everything was calm for a week. I was preparing to fly out to, fly up to Chicago. I was scheduled to preach two nights Chaplain, I was scheduled to preach at the Indian Trail Church of God in Aurora, Illinois. That was my home church till I was born in that church. I lived there, lived there attended there till I was 11. And they had invited me to come back and to preach two nights of a homecoming. And I was really looking forward to this. I hadn't been there in more than 30 years. And there were, go there were going to be several old family friends were there. My parents were driving up from Mississippi to be there. Uh, really looking forward to the opportunity to go there and to, and to preach. And I had a 6.30 flight on Wednesday morning, and Tuesday night at midnight, I have another attack from the kidney stones. And I am, I'm laying in the floor literally in a fetal position, crying in pain and praying and calling out to God. I tell you, I was doing some earnest praying. I was, I was crying out. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I needed a miracle. And I called on God intently. I went to lay down in the bed and, and prayed a little more. Jane was, she was there, knelt over me as I was in the floor praying for me as well. Thank you, darling. And I laid down, and about a half hour later, the pain subsided. I went to sleep. I slept a few hours, and I woke up. There was no pain. I admit I was a little nervous. I was nervous whether or not I should get on the plane, nervous to go, but I really wanted to do that, and I was just trusting God to take care of me. And can I tell you that there on that Tuesday night, laying in the floor, crying out and in pain. God heard my prayers. He healed my, he did heal my body. It's been over three and a half years now, and I haven't had another kidney stone attack. Thank you, Jesus. Miracles happen to those who know they need one. Miracles happen to, to those who know they need one. Some people will never admit that they need supernatural intervention in their life, and therefore they don't need a miracle, and they're not going to receive a miracle. Some feel that if they just 
work a little harder, then they'll get all of the stuff that they want or need and that they can take care of themselves by working harder or saving a little more. And there's nothing wrong with a good work ethic. You need that. You ought to have that. In fact, Paul told, told the church in Thessalonica, it's 2 Thessalonians 3.12, he said, we command such people and urge them in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and work to earn their own living. I have heard it said you do the difficult, and God will do the impossible. So we ought to work. We ought to save. We ought to take care of our responsibilities. And in the same sense, we need to also trust God with our needs. There are times that you have tried to work or work it out, and it didn't work out. And you need a miracle. Will you trust him? You know, sometimes God lets you get to, get to, allows you to get to the place where you and everybody else around you knows that it is only by the grace and the mercy of God. You become so desperate for a miracle and everybody else knows it, and God waits for that to happen so that you and everybody else will know that it is God who supplied and brought about the miracle. Zach, come give me some music, please. In 19, it was January of 1997, I was pastoring the Cass City Church of God, Cass or Living Word Worship Center Church of God in Cass City, Michigan. It's a mouthful in it. I'd been there about three months as pastor. It was a Sunday evening service, and this was the first time I'd ever seen Dennis. And Dennis walked in, and he had a great deal of trouble even getting into the church and getting into a seat on the, on the back row. He, he used those type of uh, crutches that uh, they strap around your arms and you hang onto the handles. And, and he w was having a great deal even getting to the, to the back seat to, to sit down. You could tell he was in such pain, very laborsome to walk and very awkward. I preached the message. He, I gave the altar invitation. And he came down to the altar and he... Came, he, he tried to kneel down for prayer, and the, the stage was a little, a little bit higher than this one, but just to the, my left of the pulpit, and he was trying to kneel down, and he got about halfway down trying to balance and lower himself, and got about halfway down and then just collapsed and fell and just laid there on the altar just praying and crying out. I went to pray for him. Others, we all gathered around him and just began to pray over him. I didn't know him. I didn't know his need. I certainly could tell he had been hurt and he was in severe pain, but we just prayed over him and prayed for God to bring healing. He, we prayed for just a few minutes, and, and then he kind of raised up still on his knees and just began to lift his hands up to the, to the Lord and to give God praise. And we, we began to celebrate with him. And then, then he, he just kind of shook off those crutches and he, and he stood up. He stood up without us having to pick him up. And then he just started to, to walk around. And he started walking up and down the, the center aisle of the church. And then he's running up and down the center aisle of the church. And he, he's raising hands and he's rejoicing and he's praising God because God had done one of those instantaneous miracles in his life. Like, like we saw in Acts chapter 3, he's running and leaping and he's praising God. And when all that settled down, he, he asked me an odd question. He said, Pastor, ask me, ask me some, some, some multiplication 
problems. What? He said, yeah. He said, my brain has been under such a fog. He said, I couldn't do simple math. And so I'm asking him, you know, what's seven times eight? What's nine times nine? I'm asking him these things, and he's just rattling them off, and he's, he's just smiling bigger and bigger and bigger. He had been on such heavy meds for so long, but there was no withdrawals. There, there was no more clouded mind. There was instantaneous clarity. God brought a miracle moment into that man's life. Miracles happen to people who make themselves available. You have to make yourself available in order to receive them. And for some, it means that they have to come to a place of desperation. And they've tried everything else on their own. For some, they wait until they hit that place of desperation and then well, let's, we've tried everything else. Let's, let's talk to God now. You don't have to wait. You don't have to wait until it's so desperate to talk to Him. Others have learned how to completely depend upon the, on the Lord. I've seen folks there in Haiti and in the hills in Jamaica, in the inner city, here in the U.S., where they had to trust they had to trust in the Lord to get through each and every day. And for those folks, their faith was strong because they learned what it was to trust God and they saw the hand of God continually at work. But there are many who have always been so self-sufficient that they're not used to trusting God, and so they don't make themselves available. And then there are those that they believe in God, but they never knew that God can and still does work miracles today in people's lives. I saw another man healed that could barely walk with a cane, who after, after a major accident at work and had back surgery and within a week was in a major car wreck, and then four more back surgeries, who at 37 years old couldn't even pick up his children or allow them to sit on his lap even though they were only like five and six, who, who couldn't even tie his own shoes, who who couldn't walk 10 feet without some type of assistance. I, he ended up at our, our church because he got tired of his church telling him, well, God's grace is sufficient. And he kept thinking, there's got to be more. I've got to hear more than just God's grace is sufficient for you in your situation. But they, but they wouldn't pray for God to divinely heal him or change his situation. So he, he sought us out because we were a church that did believe that God would do everything that he said he would do, that, that if it's in the book, that he still does it today. And so he sought out a church that would actually pray for him and believe God to heal him and change his situation. And I saw God miraculously, instantaneously heal that man too. <laughs> that night, 
he, he was running and leaping and praising God. He, he ran out of the church and up and down the block that the church was on. He was telling everybody he could tell, and they drove home. He had his wife stop a half mile from his house, and he got out, and he just ran the rest of the way home. But there are also people that they're just too busy to make themselves available to God. And they fall into a trap from hell. The devil would rather see you so active and busy that you never give God all of your life, that you never fully surrender because you don't have time for all of that. So here's a little warning for you. Write this down. What the devil can't stop, he accelerates. If he can't stop you, he'll try to get you so busy that you won't have time for the presence of God or the people of God. It has broken my heart at times to to pray with people who were praying and seeking God for a, for a job, and I prayed with them, and they, we celebrated with them when God gave them the job, and then they got so busy with the job that they couldn't go to the house of the, the Lord anymore. Being available. You have to be available. What does that mean? And I'll close with this. Three things in being available. First, you need to be alert. You need to be alert. You'll find a couple times there in the Gospels uh, where Jesus told the parable of the wedding feast and invited people to come to the wedding feast for his son, the groom, but they didn't come. You can read about his, the master's wrath there, but he sent servants back out to invite everyone, anyone. The verse, Luke 12, 37, the servants are ready and waiting for his return they'll be rewarded. See, there is something about us being alert to what God is doing. That we're conscious about what's going on. That we see what God is doing in the heavenlies And understand that God has a timetable, a plan, a purpose, that we're alert, that we're ready to receive when God pours out. Here's some other scripture verses from the New Testament about being alert. Things like it says, I read here where it says, stay alert, keep alert at all times. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. So be on your guard, not asleep like others. Stay alert and be clear-headed. Are you alert? Are you ready for your miracle moment? Are you looking for God to do the miraculous in your life? And are you alert enough to recognize what he is doing today and be ready to receive it yourself? We're looking for a miracle. Second one goes right along with that. Ready. And when we're ready, it ought to mean that we've got hands lifted up in praise and that we're ready to receive. I 
And we ought to be like little children. They come to their parents and they, they want something. My boys, and they're, they were one, two, two, three. They come and they, they come like this. Daddy. They wanted something. That was fine. I delighted in being able to reach down and grab them, pick them up, hold them, love on them, find out what they wanted. And if I could, and if it made sense to, to, to give it to them. We need to be ready to receive. When we read that scripture about the lame man earlier, I think verse 5, verse 5 it says, the, the lame man looked at them eagerly expecting some money. The lame man was eager. He was eager to receive. Are you? Are you eager to receive what God has for you in your life? He was expecting a blessing, but what he got was a life-changing miracle. If we could just get some more of the believers to start believing, we might start seeing miracles as opposed to simply blessings. We need to be alert, we need to be ready, and we need to be eager. Eager, having a sharp anticipation about what God is going to do. I missed reading John 9, 31. Let me read this to you. We know that God doesn't listen to sinners, but he is ready to hear those who worship him and do his will. Are you ready? Are you ready to worship him? Are you ready to give him praise for what he has done and will do in your life? And are you ready to be obedient to what he'll call you into? See, I don't believe that God just does miracles without some purpose behind them. Do you realize that every time God brings about healing in somebody's life, that 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 miracle ought to be something that is, is shared so that it builds the faith of other people, so that it's a testimony to the sinner of a loving God that takes care of his children. And so we've got to give the praise back to God to whom it is due. You can't expect a miracle to happen in your life and then think that you can just keep that to yourself. That you have a responsibility to share those things. Your miracle may be the thing that triggers somebody else, triggers their faith. And triggers it so that they will activate some faith, that they will trust God, that they'll believe. They'll have a faith and confidence. It says, well, I, I know you can because you did it for my friend, so Lord, I'm asking you to do it for me. Lord, I, I know you healed my, my sister at church, so I'm asking you to do the very same thing and to heal me. So we have to be alert, we have to be ready, we have to be eager for those miracle moments when God touches our lives. Would you stand with me?
We, we've been engaged in three weeks of fasting and praying and believing God to work in our lives. Believing God to work in our church. For believing God to work in a miraculous way. Now for some of you, it's, it's time for you to step up and step out in faith in order to receive what what God has for you today. You need to start trusting God with everything. You got that song ready, Zach? Go ahead and sing that song. Cause nothing is impossible for you. Nothing is impossible Cause nothing is impossible for you Cause you hold my world in your hands Nothing is impossible Go ahead and sing it to the Lord Nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible for you. Cause you hold my world in your head. I believe. Yes, I do, Lord. And I believe you are all I need. Oh, and I believe you're my portion. And I believe you more than. you you can come I invite you to come and sing this song to the Lord and we'll pray with you and we will believe God with you I believe we'll see the hand of God be poured out in this place and his miracle working power